um, and we're going to get started. So this program tonight is in conjunction with the exhibition Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera, and Mexican Modernism at Albuquerque Museum um, through May the 2nd. Um, this, uh, this program tonight is being uh, is featuring uh, filmmaker Mary Lance, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Mary. Mary um, is a filmmaker with over 40 years of experience in documentary production. Her work has been shown at Tate Modern, the Museum of Modern Art, the Guggenheim Museum, and, and many other venues worldwide. She has made documentaries about indigo, which um, will be a, featured in a future exhibition at the museum, um, artists Agnes Martin and Diego Rivera, and the New Deal art projects of the 1930s in addition to many document documentaries for museums and arts organizations. Her latest documentary is Crowville, a short film about the winter crow roost in Corrales Bosque. Since we have many people from Corrales on here, they're probably familiar with that. So the film that um, will be discussed tonight um, is I Paint What I See, and that is on view currently um, in the Frida uh, in Diego exhibition at the museum. Um, so I will now go ahead and turn it over uh, to Mary Lance to get us started. Thanks, Mary. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And thank you for inviting me to do this lecture. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'd like to also thank Josie Lopez for um, including the film in, in the exhibition, which is really a wonderful exhibition. Um, I, I'm guessing that most of the people here have seen it, but you know, um, if you haven't, it's really a must be, go see it. <laughs> um, so I'll be speaking about what drew me to the subject of the film and um, telling some stories about making it. The documentary Diego Rivera, I, ba I Paint What I See, uh, was made over a period of years between 1985 and 1989, although I'd been the subject for some time before. Um, I was living in New York at the time. It was a collaboration with Eric Breitbart, who co-produced it with me, wrote the script, and did most of the cinematography. It was shot and edited in 16 millimeter film, as we did in those days, and um, it's an hour long. <clears throat> Early on, we, excuse me one sec. There. Early on, we decided to make a biographical film and to build it around Rivera's own words from his writings, rather than including interviews. Um, I'll be including a few clips from the film here. The first one is from early in the film, at the point where Rivera returned to Mexico from his time in Europe in the 1920s. I bought so a new society which could need an art that people would have access to in places they frequented in their daily life. Post offices, schools, theaters, railroad stations, and public buildings. Logically, but theoretically, I arrived at the mural painting. The political situation in Mexico seemed to favor my prospects. The artist with my revolutionary point of view could find a place. The exile was coming home. My homecoming produced an aesthetic exhilaration which was impossible to describe. It was as if I were being born anew, born into a new world. All the colors I saw appeared to be heightened. They were clearer, richer, finer, and more full of light. In everything, I saw a potential masterpiece. The crowds, the markets, the festivals, the working men in shops and fields, in every glowing face, in every luminous child. All was revealed to me. I had the conviction that if I lived a hundred lives, I could not exhaust even a fraction of this store of buoyant beauty. Um, I'd like to credit the actors and the main creative partners in the film. Uh, the actors you'll hear, hear in these clips are Julio Medina, who, as you just heard, did the voice of Diego Rivera, 
Rosanna de Soto, who played Frida Kahlo, John Hutton, the narrator, Joe Barrett, who reads a reporter, a part of a reporter, and Stephen Culp, who will, you'll be hearing as the young Nelson Rockefeller later on. Sarah Fishko was the film editor, Brian Keane composed the music, and Patricia McFate was executive producer. The work in the exhibition at the Albuquerque Museum is from the collection of Jacques and Natasha Gelman, who lived in Mexico City. I'm starting with this painting from the exhibition, which is so beautiful. Um, Frida Kahlo's self-portrait with Jade Necklace, 1933 because when we were making the film, we actually filmed this painting in Natasha Gelman's apartment. I'd seen the painting in this photograph by Frida's friend, Lucien Bloch, which we plan to include in the film. So I really wanted to get a shot of the actual painting itself. I found out that it was in the Gelman's collection. And on the last day of our last shoot in Mexico City in 1989, uh, we were sitting in our hotel, in the hotel room talking about my saying, I wish I could get a shot of that painting. So our associate producer, Marlene Ehrenberg, called Mrs. Gelman, got her on the phone and explained what we were doing. So she basically said, come right over, and which was pretty remarkable. <laughs> and uh, so we drove over to her apartment and uh, we had already given up our van from the shoot. Um, since we were, you know, we assumed that we were finished uh, shooting. Uh, so we squeezed into, most of us squeezed into a Volkswagen bug and um, went over to their apartment. Um, when we got to her apartment, we were welcomed in and there on an easel in the apartment, in the living room of the apartment was the painting. I was surprised that it was so small and it was painted on tin like a retablo. So we were able to do what I envisioned, which was to cut from the actual painting, the painted photograph and pan down to Frida seated. So backing up, the idea for a biographical film about Rivera had come from, had been incubating since around 1980, when I was making my first documentary, Artists at Work, artists at work. It's about artists who worked on the New Deal art projects of the 1930s. Several of the artists I interviewed then told me that they were inspired by the Mexican muralists, especially Rivera, who had spent time in New York in the early 30s. At the time, there were no films about Rivera available in the USA. And there were really, it's hard to believe, but there were almost no books in print about Rivera and the Mexican muralists at the time in the early 80s. Uh, so I thought because of his influence, he should be better known to a wide public in this country. And I decided to make a documentary. And Rivera's start, story starting in the late 1920s was also was deeply entwined with the story of Frida Kahlo. Before beginning to shoot and throughout the whole production, we did extensive film and photo research, went to a number of research collections around the country and in Mexico and searched newspaper clippings, researched write Rivera's writings for the script. This is one of several research binders that we put together. I spent a lot of time doing archival research in the 1980s, both for my own films and for many others. Our documentary includes lots of archival film some, as I'll mention later, came from the National Archives. At the time, they had flatbed viewers like Steenbeck's, but a lot of the other archives um, in the 80s uh, required cranking through newsreels uh, with rewinds and eyeballing the image on a little viewer <laughs> on a table. So it was uh, very, very different uh, from what exists today that, that uh, that's completely Part of the past um, because so much has been transferred to digital uh, video or digital files. Um, so that kind of research is completely a thing of the past and um, even researching can be done online now. Uh, the film was funded by grants, which meant that we had to apply to several places for funding. 
This takes time. The grant writing takes time, lots of time, and waiting for responses takes time. When funding does come, it comes in piecemeal. So each time we received enough funding, we'd go back to Mexico. And here's a photo of Eric Breitbart shooting at Frida's home in Coyoacan in the southern part of Mexico City with his 16 millimeter camera. So we'd shoot a portion of the story, return to New York, get the film processed and go back to fundraising and whatever other work we were doing. In the end, we were able to get the funding we needed primarily from, mainly from the National Endowment for the Humanities I got an individual artist grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, and we got, also got a grant from the National and um, a New York Council for the Humanities, plus several smaller grants. We began shooting in Mexico City in around 1986, following the major earthquake that had occurred the previous year. One of the first shoots was at the Casa Azul, Frida's family home in Coyoacan, where she lived for most of her life. When we filmed there, it was still private, but now it's open as a museum, the Museo Frida Kahlo. Uh, this is Frida's studio, and uh, it's a wonderful place. It's filled with Frida's things and well worth visiting. And there's the mirror she used for lots of her self-portraits. We filmed most of Rivera's Mexico, uh, murals in Mexico City. This photo is from our shoot at the Ministry of Edu Public Education, the Secretaria de Educación Pública. This was our crew for that shoot. Antonio Chavez on the left, he was a grip. Marlene Ehrenberg, associate producer, myself. Uh, Benjamin, who was our van driver. Uh, Lucio Lopez Lowe, an advisor. Eric Breitbart, who was uh, my co-producer, also the, wrote the script and did most of the cinematography, and Patricia McFate, executive producer. Rivera began a series of murals in this location in 1923. The previous year, he and a group of other artists, including Siqueiros, Carlos Merida, and Orozco, and others formed the Union of Technical Workers, Painters, and Sculptors, with the aim of painting murals, producing art that would be accessible to all, not just the elite. This was a concept that uh, was an outgrowth of the Mexican Revolution. Rivera also joined the Communist Party in 1922. The mural work was a monumental shift from the way that art had been perceived for hundreds of years. I think the Mexican mural movement was the, res the root of all the public art projects that, we that have been done since. And Rivera was one of its chief protagonists. Along with Orozco and Siqueiros, he had a big influence on American art of the period, especially as I mentioned on the artists who uh, participated in the New Deal art projects of the 1930s. Here's a clip from the film about Rivera's work at the Ministry of Education. Um, it was his second mural project. The murals line three levels of two courtyards. So it's, it's just an enormous amount of work. You can see in these murals, his commitment to portraying working people and the dignity of labor. Before beginning to paint, I studied the quality and intensity of the sunlight, which hit a particular wall and the architectural details the arches and columns, and how they broke the sunlight and framed the space. I spent over four years on the frescoes. Each was individual and separate in itself, yet all were interrelated. I kept making discoveries in the techniques of painting on wall surfaces. Gradually, I worked out the procedures, which I have followed more or less to the present day. The walls of the ministry came alive with scenes from the daily life of Mexico. Villages in Tehuantepec, outdoor markets, workers in factories and the silver mine Rivera remembered from his childhood. It was a revolutionary idea, painting images drawn from the lives of workers and peasants on the walls of a government building. <laughs> Rivera 
recalled his experience with Cubism. He used his knowledge of color and form to compose the frescoes and integrate them into the architecture of the building. But it was the subject matter more than anything else that enabled Rivera to find himself as an artist. So shooting there was pretty challenging because the murals are all um, under the portal and uh, they're in shadow for a lot of the day. And um, we used a big reflector to bounce light up onto the paintings. Um, but as the sun moved around, moved across, uh, and as the day went on, um, that was constantly changing. So shadows started to fall on the mural paintings that were next to, near the ones that we had just filmed. So we had to run around carrying our equipment to different parts of the building, um, to, to places with no shadow, and then bounce the light on, on that mural so we could get on that panel so we could get flat lighting. We also filmed his other murals in Mexico City in Cuernavaca, and we filmed it in Guanajuato at his family home, which is the now the Museo Casa Diego Rivera. In the early 1930s, Diego and Frida made several trips to the United States. In 1930, they went to San Francisco, where Diego had been invited to paint a mural at the Pacific Stock Exchange and then at the California School of Fine Arts, which is now known as the San Francisco Art Institute. The making of a fresco showing the building of a city at the San Francisco Art Institute was painted in 1931. He'd had the idea of the social necessity of art since his time in Europe. In this mural, again, you can see his emphasis on depicting people at work. There's a mention in the film that there were some complaints about him putting his backside in such a prominent place. He replied that that's the view of him that most people are familiar with. He really had a sense of humor. <laughs> this mural has been in the news lately because there were reports that to raise funds, the San Francisco Art Institute had discussed selling the mural to George Lucas's Museum of Narrative Art in Los Angeles, which is in development now. Uh, so there were big protests and uh, the city of San Francisco voted to give it landmark status, but I think it's still kind of in flux. And I don't think, as far as I know, a final solution has, been, has not been reached, but uh, many, many people want to keep it where it belongs. So hopefully that will happen. In 1931, Frida and Diego went to New York. Rivera was preparing a series of mural panels for a one-person show at the Museum of Modern Art. And helped arrange for a one-man show at the Museum of Modern Art, only the second in its history. The Matisse show the previous year had been popular, but Rivera's was an even greater success. 30,000 people paid to see it in the first two weeks. He painted a number of portable frescoes for the exhibit. Several were adapted from his Mexican murals. The others were scenes of New York. The most controversial of these was called Frozen Assets. It represented various strata of life in New York during the Great Depression. At the top loom skyscrapers like mausoleums, reaching up into the cold night. In the center was a bar used by homeless unemployed as their dormitory. In the lower part of the panel, I showed a steel grilled safe deposit board in which a lady was placing her jewels. My exhibition was well received, though there was embarrassment in some quarters about the frankness with which I represented the current economic crisis. Um. So this is Frozen Assets. That's the name of this uh, mural panel. It's an incredible painting, which I, um, it's, a, it's a large fresco panel, maybe six feet tall. Um, 
so the show at MoMA uh, showed many of his paintings, but it also showed a series of these mural panels, as you heard in that clip. Um, and um, we had seen this painting, a picture of this painting in a book from the 1930s and really wanted to include it in the film. It was in a large private collection and is, it still is in a large private collection of Frida's and Diego's work in uh, a hacienda called La Noria in Xochimilco in the southern part of Mexico City. Um, so it took a long time to make arrangements to shoot there. And I remember when we were driving back from our shoot in Guanajuato to Mexico City, um, having to pull over to find a phone where we could make a long distance call, this is well before cell phones, uh, to check on the arrangements. But um, eventually everything fell into place. We got permission and we were able to uh, go there to, to La Noria to film Frozen Assets. That collection is now open as a museum. It's called the Museo Dolores Olmero. While Rivera was in San Francisco, he was introduced to the director of the Detroit Institute of Arts, and he told him that he wanted to visit Detroit to study the industrial environment. He was really fascinated with industrial, with machines and other industrial um, equipment. His fame spread. He was invited to Detroit to paint a mural in the Detroit Institute of Arts to celebrate the city's industry. Rivera spent three months absorbing the sounds and the images of Detroit's chemical plants, steel mills, and automobile factories. He struggled with the problems of adapting the subject to the decorative architecture of the Institute's garden court. As the mural took shape in his mind, Rivera decided that it would focus on the Ford automobile plant at River Rouge. The Rouge was the largest industrial complex in the world. To Rivera, it was the symbol of marriage. So Rivera began working on the mural series Detroit Institute, a Detroit industry at the Detroit Institute of Arts in 1932. To quote Alicia Azuela in Diego Rivera and Detroit, one of the greatest desires of his life was to create an art that would treat the machine as both an aesthetic object and a generating force in the process of social change, end quote. With this monumental series, which was based on the Ford Rouge plant that's just outside Detroit, he was able to merge that idea with his concern for depicting people at work. This footage was taken by a film crew from the Ford Motor Company and it's now in the National Archives, along with all the other films that they took for Henry Ford. In this shot, you can see Frida on the scaffold with him, and you can just glimpse uh, Henry Ford's head in the lower, well, you could. <laughs> oh, there it is, in the uh, lower section of the mural. Here's an excerpt from our film about Frida's time in Detroit. Frida sketched in the court to the amusement of journalists who declined to take her seriously. She was more often seen as the young wife of a great artist, not as a painter in her own right. She herself had doubts and expressed them in a letter to one of her American friends, Abby Aldrich Rockefeller. I am painting a little bit too not because I consider myself an artist or something like that, but simply because I have nothing else to do here. And because working, I can forget a little all the troubles I had last year. I am doing oils on small plates of aluminum. Rita's accident had made it impossible for her to have children, but she became pregnant against her doctor's advice, then suffered a serious miscarriage. Her weeks in the hospital changed the way she saw herself as an artist. The lithograph, Frida and the Miscarriage, 1932, one of her most powerful works is in the exhibition at the Albuquerque Museum. Earlier, I mentioned the profound influence of Rivera and the other artists of the Mexican mural movement. 
The influence of Frida Kahlo's work has been enormous, particularly to women artists and artists who draw on personal experience, interior experience. I found this clipping from the Detroit News in a scrapbook at the Detroit Institute of Arts archive and it blew me away. It's partly titled, Visiting the Homes of Interesting People. Here's an excerpt written by Florence Davies, who spoke about Frida painting the, our friend, the self-portrait with, with Jade Necklace at their temporary home in Detroit. Thus, while her husband paints with large brushes on a huge wall surface, his wife, herself a miniature-like little person with her long black braids wound demurely around her head, and a foolish little ruffled apron over her black silk dress in lieu of a smock, chooses a small metal panel and paints with tiny camel hair brushes. This documents the utter lack of respect that was afforded her at the time. And of course, a lack of understanding of the power that she was able to unleash with those tiny brushes. I'll switch to a bad photocopy of the clipping because it's framed a little wider. In the lower right, you can see the, an, an inset with the painting self-portrait on the borderline between Mexico and the United States, another one of her great, greatest paintings. <clears throat> this photo of Diego watching her paint it is in the Mexican mural, muralism exhibit. And I didn't know until I saw this photo that she had painted part of it, at least in the Detroit Institute of Arts during the time Diego was working on the mural. And by the expression on his face, I think you could see the respect that he had for Frida's work. I have a few photos from our shoot at the DIA. Uh, here I am framing a shot with Nancy Schreiber, the cinematographer for that segment of our film on the right. Here's Nancy on a dolly getting ready to shoot. In this photo, you get a sense of the magnitude of the mural project. Uh, in the background, you see the south wall and uh, with one of the most prominent figures in the mural series, um, a stamping press at the Ford Rouge, which Rivera interpreted with an echo of the shape of the pre-Columbian pre goddess Coatlicue. I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. For reference, here's an image of the goddess from Tenochtitlan, and is now, which is now in the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. And here's a wider production photo with Nancy shooting on a lift, uh, shooting the south wall and me safely on terra firma. You get a better view of the stamping press on the right and you get some sense of the immensity of the project. Um, in the do documentaries, there are some overall views that give a sense of the whole. In the center panel, Rivera painted the assembly line at the Ford Rouge plant. Henry Ford pioneered the use of the moving assembly line for manufacturing cars. And Rivera was fascinated by the workings of the Rouge. We filmed at the Rouge, but decided that this archive footage had more impact than our contemporary color footage of Mustangs being made. Inside the factory, there was an overwhelming sense of compressed space. When I went there, I really understood the genius of Rivera's representation in the mural of the space in that factory. In 1932, Frida and Diego went to New York again for another big mural commission. There's a long sequence in the film about his mural at Rockefeller Center. I'll show two excerpts from, the film, from it and then talk about it. In Midtown Manhattan, construction was underway for Rockefeller Center, the largest office and entertainment complex ever built. Diego and Frida arrived in New York as celebrities. He was at the height of his fame and had the distinction of being a communist painter sought after by the world's richest capitalists. Architect Raymond Hood had designed the project, 
a philosophy professor from California proposed the center's theme, Homo Fabor, Man the Builder. We had been researching visual material for the sequence for some time. And we were already in touch with Lucien Bloch, who was Rivera's assistant on the mural, who took the photos of him that you'll see in the next, next clip. But early on, a producer friend had mentioned that she'd used some footage of the building of Rockefeller Center in a TV program that she had made. And she said that there were shots of Rivera in it. Uh, and she gave me the name of the filmmaker and his phone number. For a long time, many, many times I tried to reach him, but nobody ever answered the phone. But when we were editing and really close to finishing editing, uh, I, I tried again one more time and a man answered the phone. It was Walter Killam, who was a young man, as a young man had worked for the architectural firm that built Rockefeller Center at the time that it was being built. And he used to go out with his 16 millimeter camera at lunchtime on his lunch hour. And he had in fact filmed Rivera painting the mural. So you'll see those shots um, along with Lucy and his other many of his other shots of uh, the building of the buildings uh, along with Lucien Bloch's photos in this clip. But the recreated shots of the typewriter are ours. In the beginning, I explained to the architects and managers of the building the only possible interpretation of the theme for a man of my opinion. The crossroads were the individualist, capitalist order on one hand and the collectivist and socialist order on the other. Nelson Rockefeller wrote Rivera. From all the reports I get, you were making very rapid progress and everyone is most enthusiastic about the work you were doing. The reporter for the New York World Telegram was working on a story that foreshadowed the approaching controversy. Diego Rivera, great Mexican mural painter, over whose shaggy head many storms have broken, is completing on the walls of the RCA building in Rockefeller Center a magnificent fresco that is likely to provoke the greatest sensation of his career. The owners of the building were perfectly familiar with my personality as an artist and man, and with my ideas and revolutionary history. There was absolutely nothing that might have led them to expect from me anything but my honest opinions honestly expressed. The painting is a forthright statement of the communist viewpoint, unmistakable as such and intended to be unmistakable, and it's being paid for by John D. Rockefeller Jr., whose opposition to collectivist principles has been unwavering over a lifetime. As you know, the building opens the 1st of May. And it will be tremendously effective to have your mural there to greet people as they come in for the opening. On the 24th of April, a World Telegram article appeared. Rivera perpetuates scenes of communist activity for RCA walls and Rockefeller Jr. foots bill. Rivera kept working, but on the 4th of May, Nelson Rockefeller wrote him a letter. When I was in the number one building at Rockefeller Center yesterday, viewing the progress of your thrilling mural, I noticed that in the most recent portion of the painting, you had included a portrait of Lenin. As much as I dislike to do so, I am afraid we must ask you to substitute the face of some unknown man where Lenin's face now appears. Rivera offered to balance Lenin with Abraham Lincoln and other figures from American history, but he would not remove the communist leader. I am sure that the class of person who is capable of being offended by the portrait of a deceased great man would feel offended by the entire conception of my painting. Therefore, rather than mutilate the conception, I should prefer the physical destruction of the conception in its entirety, preserving at least its integrity. Despite new demands to remove Lenin's portrait, Rivera tried to complete his work. On the 9th of May, he was paid the remainder of his fee and ordered out of the building. Sheets of canvas were nailed to the mural. So we're very fortunate that Mr. Killam captured Rivera on film and that Lucien Bloch took the photos of the work in progress. I'm not aware of any other images of this mural, which was destroyed. But Rivera recreated it at the Palacio de Bellas Artes in Mexico City, which we filmed for the museum for the documentary, excuse me. And uh, you can see it there. You can see it 
at the Palacio de Bellas Artes. Lucien Bloch was an artist who worked in multiple media. She had met uh, Diego and Frida when they were in New York for the show at the Museum of Modern Art. She and her husband, Stephen Dimitrov, were both mural assistants for Rivera and on different uh, murals, and later created uh, and taught fresco painting. The exhibition at the Albuquerque Museum includes several gorgeous photos of Frida by Nicholas Murai. We were fortunate to be able to get some wonderful color home movie style footage that we of that he took of uh, Diego and Frida at the Casa Azul. And we ended the film with a freeze frame of Rivera from that footage. And I'll end this talk with this portrait of Frida. Um, supposed to be one more slide, but I'm not seeing it. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that, that will Great. be the end. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Mary. We very much appreciate um, that uh, investigation into the process of creating the, the film and some wonderful uh, teasers to, um, to actually see the, the film ourselves uh, as well in full. Um, so I am going to encourage people now to put any questions into the chat. I'll see if there's anything um that uh that we can address in here um got a lot of comments about where people are from uh let's see give me a moment to scroll through here let's see ah so um what was your favorite part of the documentary to film Uh, I love free, filming in Frida's house, and um, I also really loved filming the, the murals at the Ministry of Education. Uh, I think those would, would have to be my favorite parts. That's great. And I'm scrolling through here. Um, so some people are asking about the best way to see this film if they can't um, you know, can't come to the museum. How, how is this, is this film accessible in another way? Yes, it is. Um, there are DVDs available. It's, it's, well, there are DVDs available, uh, which you can find at my website, which is newdealfilms.com. Uh, it's also for anybody who has, uh, this doesn't apply to people in the Albuquerque area, but uh, for anyone who's, who has access to canopy streaming, either through a university or um, a public library that subscribes to Canopy, Canopy um, can view it on there. And this question is, has, has your documentary been digitized? I'm not sure, I'd have to explain Yes, that. it has been digitized uh, for, by can for Canopy for that, that um, digital screening that's available through them. Uh, and here is a general question about, um, are you able to share anything more about your interactions, I think, with Mrs. Gelman? Somebody's very well, curious about her. <laughs> she is a curious she, person, right? She was really great. She was so uh, welcoming. <laughs> and uh, uh, when we when we actually arrived at, the, at her apartment, um, she... Uh, we knocked on the door, rang the bell, whatever, and um, a man who works for her, I guess maybe kind of a butler, answered the door and he was, he looked really suspicious. <laughs> he looked at us in a very suspicious way. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, we had been on a shoot for two weeks. We probably weren't groomed in the most, you know, we didn't have the best grooming at the moment. Uh, so she came and she, you know, invited us in, let them, you know, please invite them in. And she was just uh, utterly charming. And uh, so I was, when I found out that this exhibition of their collection was coming to town, it was, it was, it was pretty great. Nice. And what a collection, what a collection it is. It's just immense. Yeah, we only have a very small piece of, of it here. That's for sure. So there's much more to see. Um, so this one is about um, filming in Frida's home. 
Um, and it's about of all the great pieces and things in her space, what stood out to you most um, and what stuck with you after leaving? That's a long time ago. So that <laughs> Yes, it was a long time ago, but I remember it really well. Um, uh, well, there was some of her clothing and her jewelry was display. I think they probably are now. I haven't been there back since it's been a museum. So I don't know how much it's changed, but I'm sure that her things are all on display there. And I imagine those things are on display. The kitchen was just fantastic. And um, there was a bedroom. Well, the, you, you saw the little bedroom that Frida slept in in her later years, but there was an, another bedroom where there was a little embroidered pillow on the, on the bed um, that I don't think she had, I think it was, you know, Mexican embroidery that you could, you know, fabric or pillow that you could buy with beautiful Mexican embroidery on it um, that said something about mi amor. <laughs> it was just so touching. Mm. Um, everything in the place was incredibly touching. And I love, also loved, of course, her studio, seeing where she worked. <clears throat> yeah, the personal effects things always really get me. You get to know a lot more about a person um, yeah. by seeing that. Um, so this says, um, I was struck by the involvement of Rivera and Trotsky. Um, how close was this? Did you investigate that at all in your film? Yeah, there's a sequence about that in the film. Uh, Rivera invited Trotsky to come to Mexico City and, and he and his wife uh, went there and lived there for several years. Uh, and they lived in a house that's very close to Frida's house um, in the same neighborhood. Um, and it's, uh, I believe, still open to the public. Um, we filmed there. So you could see that in the film. Uh, uh, it was a very complicated relationship. <laughs> so um, there, you can, there's information about it in the film, but um, yeah. Great. Yeah, lot, lot to unpack, it sounds like. That's a whole nother story itself. Um, it says, uh, what are your thoughts on the mur murals for the Green New Deal? Do you know what that reference is? Murals for the Green New Deal? Yeah. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of it, but if it's a, you know, mural project, a public mural projects to support artists, I'm all for it. Yeah. Valerie, do you want to unmute? Do you, do you mean, uh, is this uh, for our current times? Do you want to confirm that if you're still on? Don't know if she can unmute. I'll go on to the next one. Um, so how do you how do you do this film today? How would you do this film today, given all the changes in technology, politics, etc.? Ah, huh. Well, uh, well, uh, it, I don't think I would be able to do it today because, well, for various reasons, one of which is I would not been a, be able to get the funding that we were able to get in the early, early and mid eighties. Um, um, it would obviously be done in a very different style because I don't work in the style. Um, it probably would be more about Frida than Diego, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, I, uh, I'm not so sure that at this point I would feel like it was my story to tell. Right. Um, and so this kind of touches on that a little bit. So since you made the film, Frida has become a huge icon in the art world and in popular culture. Did you have the sense of the possibility that continued rise to fame when you made the film. Did you could you sense that about Frida? Well, I know, I certainly didn't envision the you know the the huge amount of tchotchkes and <laughs> Frida everything that's all over the place that I never would have dreamed of, dreamed. But uh, I I mean I it, it was very clear that she was a really powerful artist, a great artist, and. Um, I'm really glad that she's gotten her due. Um, besides this film, do you work in other mediums? Someone is curious to know besides film. I do yeah. nowadays. I mean, I've, I've done some drawing over, you know, over the years, but nowadays um, 
I do uh, some indigo dyeing from time to time because mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm really interested in indigo. I also made a film about that. Um, uh, and I'm not currently working on a film, but um, I will be again. Yeah. Yeah, we're exploring that uh, concept of in indigo for possibly an upcoming exhibit here at the museum, I think. Uh, great idea. Jo yeah, I don't know if Josie's been in contact with you yet about that. Yeah. But. Mm -hmm very much a possibility. And someone asked if you met Dolores Olmedo in any of your travels. I did, I did meet Dolores Olmedo a couple of times. Um, when we filmed at the uh, Frida Kahlo, at the Casa Azul, Frida's house, uh, she at the time was sort of, um, that property kind of fell under her, under her purview at the time. And um, so I met her at that time. And I met her again because uh, La Noria, the place I was describing that's a hacienda in Xochimilco was her home. And um, so uh, I met her when we filmed there. Remind me, Mary, was she a patron? Wasn't she a big patron of, of She was Rera? a friend of Diego's, an old friend of Diego's. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I don't understand. I don't know any of the details, but my understanding is that um, she uh, was the recipient of his estate. Uh -huh. Interesting. Yeah. Well, um, I think that's we've come to the end of our program. Somebody here is asking me if there will be a recording available later for viewing. And yes, there will. It usually takes us a couple days uh, to get it up um, on the museum's website. Um, so uh, we hope um, that you um, will come and see uh, Mary's film here or uh, pick one up on her website. Thanks again for being with us tonight, Mary, and sharing your practice and sharing this wonderful film um, and uh, shedding a little light on Diego, who um, maybe at this time is not the rock star uh, that, that he was at that time. So it's nice to understand really um, the impact of his work and just uh, the genius and and the scale, um, so many things um, in terms of those murals. They're just really um, very impactful and important, um, important to keep telling that story in a time when, right, murals are, um, as you mentioned, um, you know, uh, some, some are disappearing. So, uh, so thank you again for sharing that wonderful story. And uh, you all have a great uh, evening and um, hopefully you can join us for one of our uh, upcoming programs again. So thanks thank all you, and thank have a good night. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.